we, we tend to think of those theological things and the other things mentioned, all excellent responses. Today we're going to look at uh, something in God's Word that we may not usually think of as a call to be holy, but I ask you to open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 2 at verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'm actually going to be reading a handful of verses before verse 17. So 1 Peter chapter 2, it's towards the back, a couple of books before Revelation. If it's in God's word, it's holiness. Amen? Amen. 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 First Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. This is the Apostle Peter writing to the church, to believers in Christ. And this is what he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, or the unbelievers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the kings as the supreme authority or to governors, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor our focus verse in all that, although there are many sermons nestled in that passage of Scripture, is verse 17. Show proper respect to everyone. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may what you want to be spoken today be done so. May your word be heard, whether it be through me or in spite of me, and may we live what we learn according to the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. 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 So here we are, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. And it said, show proper respect to everyone. We live in a world today where it seems like there's less and less respect. I don't need to stand up here and give you a long list of things. You see what's going on. You may watch the news, you may not, you may have experienced things uh, firsthand where there is less and less respect in our world. But just a few things that we are reminded of this morning is that uh, we see more and more of an uncivil public discourse. Less and less respect in public for other people by words and by actions. We see today in our world that there's more, or maybe it's just what I happen to notice, but it seems to me like there's more public slandering of people and their names and their actions through letters to the editors. It's not a knock on any paper. People write the letters to the editor, but we read where oftentimes there's back and forth name calling accusations and things like that. We've seen that in our own community over the last year or so in public discourse and letters to the editors and things like that. There is a lewdness in our culture. And by that, I would say that nothing is off limits. People's faith can be mocked or, or put into cartoons or whatever the case may be. Just nothing is off limits nowadays. Things that used to be considered sacred in our culture, even if not sacred scripturally, sacred symbolically, you know, the term, well, that's a sacred thing, don't go there. There's none of that anymore. Nothing is off limits. I did read recently, I actually saw recently, just a few days ago, that there was an incident not too long ago at a fast food restaurant in California where a woman had her two little toddlers and she wanted to take them into the play area of the fast food restaurant. A 
and there was a group of teenagers messing around in there. And she asked them if they would leave so that her two little toddlers could play in the play area. And they became very obnoxious and started trying to pick a fight with her. And they ended up throwing things at her right in front of her two little kids. Cups of ice and other things like that. You can imagine what the little toddlers were, how they were reacting. Well, management came and got involved. And the, the teenagers started tearing up the restaurant and throwing things at the managers and all. I mean, there's just that lack of respect and you know not that not that I've ever been perfect or an angel but I have to admit that I thought about back to my days in college when my best friend at the time Tom uh, he and I were good buddies and after classes in the evening we would go to one of the local stores and you know we'd get our coke and hang out for the evening and stuff and there was a local store that had a pool table in it and it was just a local uh, type of department store and so Tom and I would go in in the evenings and there were cue sticks there. We'd start playing pool right in the store. And we didn't raise any trouble. We kept our voices down, we were very quiet. And the manager came along one night and he said, what do you guys think you're doing? And we said, well, we're just playing a little pool here quiet. We're right smack in the middle of the store. People are shopping around and stuff. And he said, you can't do that, that's not allowed. Well, Tom and I we were business majors, so in all of our business, degreeism that we were working for and our vast knowledge of how the economy works, we very respectfully said to the manager, well, what would you think of this? What better way to advertise this pool table than if people came in and saw two young men in here quietly, respectfully playing pool? Wouldn't that be good advertising for the product? And he thought a minute and he said, okay, go ahead and play. So we did. We, you know, we didn't trash the place. We didn't get violent. We didn't scream at the guy or whatever. Well, that was yesteryear and, and all that. But, you know, the call to respect others is nothing new, and it's not confined to the New Testament, because if we go back to the Ten Commandments that Mike so uh, wonderfully read, and appreciate your prayer this morning, Mike, What's the first thing you notice, and this is a summary, what's the first thing you notice about the Ten Commandments? What's that? A lot of no's, okay, for our good though, right? But what else? The first four are about God. The first four are about our relationship with God, therefore the next six are about our relationship with whom? People. Other people. Our neighbors, other people, whatever. You ever find it interesting that God tells us that there are six commandments to deal with our relationship with other people and four with him that's not to say that he isn't as important or anything like that maybe he did the maybe he did it that way just the four because we tend to overcomplicate how things ought to be with God and he's you know it's really not that complex but maybe also he only gave us four because he's in charge and he calls the shots and someday we're going to stand before him but whatever the reason, one of the things we can ascertain from the Ten Commandments is that our respect for other people is of importance to God. In fact, one of the things we would see in the Bible, I would dare say, is this, that maybe what God's trying to tell us here is that our relationship with him is in part determined by or indicated by how we interact with other people. And really, these are all about respect. The Ten Commandments are all about respecting God and respecting other people. For in the Bible, the word respect actually has two meanings. It means to honor and consider the value of. It also means to fear, not as in chomping on our fingernails, being afraid to approach somebody or whatever, but that ultimate reverence and respect. Well, I just used a word to define it with respect, respect. But so we think about it. We are called to respect God, to honor, to consider the value of, and as the scripture says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But we are also called to respect, even though the word respect is not in the Ten Commandments, we're called to respect other people for, for if we are really to honor our parents, even those who have wronged us, and of course we know we need to forgive, and I'm not going to go on a long other part B sermon about that this morning, but if we're to honor our mother and father, that means that we have to respect them as Mike prayed, and I didn't know that Mike was going to pray that this morning. 
But think about the rest of the other six uh, on the right side of your screen. Uh, if we're not going to murder, if we're going to take that commandment so seriously, that means that I, I'm going to respect someone so much that I do not want to bring them physical harm. And by the way, we're reminded that Jesus equated anger and angry words with murder. So we cannot just confine that, even though the original intent of that was murder in the physical sense, Jesus stretched it out and included our words and our attitudes toward others. So if I respect Harvey like I ought to, then I'm not going to murder him with my words either. If I respect my wife, I'm not going to commit adultery. And if I respect my buddy and his wife, I'm not going to want to have any adulterous thing going on there. If, if I respect my employer like I ought, I'm not going to steal. And if I respect somebody who has written a song and it's copyrighted, I'm not going to steal any material, an idea from somebody or a song from somebody that's copyrighted. That's why there's proper ways of using things in public, like the songs, and that's why we have a copyright license at the church and things like that. You get the point. If I respect my neighbor, I'm not going to falsely bear witness or testify against them or say anything that would be untrue about them in the community, and I'm certainly not going to covet if I respect my neighbor in all those ways that the commandments show. So the Ten Commandments are really about respect, and respect's been around a long time. And if you think about it, going way back to the garden where it always seems to start, think about how Adam and Eve disrespected God, didn't take to heart what God said, and it cost them dearly. But then it brought disrespect into their marriage, because you remember that thing, right? God said, why did you eat the fruit? Of course, I'm paraphrasing here. And, and uh, Adam and Eve said, well, the serpent deceived me, so I ate it. If we were to read between the lines, it's almost as if Eve was saying, the serpent deceived me, so I disrespected you, God. I didn't take to heart what you said. I didn't honor you, God. And then, of course, we know when God looked at Adam, what did he ask? What happened? And Adam said, well, that woman you gave me, God. So there was disrespect for God and disrespect between the husband and the wife. And, you know, and then what happened? It trickled down with Cain and Abel, and Cain didn't respect God. And and then he didn't respect his brother, and he killed his brother. And because that disrespect came into humanity, just like all the other sin in the world, and trickled down throughout humanity, it really is the way of the world. Disrespect. It's the way of the world. But my brothers and sisters, you and I are not to be of the world. Amen? Amen. Because the scriptures tell us in James 1.27, would you read it out loud with me, please? Pure, unspoiled religion in the eyes of God our Father is this, coming to the help of orphans and widows when they need it, and keeping oneself from being contaminated by the world. That thing of disrespect originated in the garden, and it has impacted humanity. And we are called to not be of the world but to be of things of the kingdom. Amen? Amen? So we have to look at the issue of respect in the Bible, and we have to see what is God telling us about respect, and how can we be on our guard to not let this issue of the world contaminate us. It doesn't take much to contaminate. If you had a gallon of water, would you drink it if there was a half a teaspoon of WD-40 put in it? Of course not. So what does God have to say about respect? As I mentioned, I just want to emphasize it one more time. Respect means to honor and to remember the value of. Remember the value of. It does also mean, as I said, that, that fear and that awe. So one of the things we have to keep in mind is this. When it comes to the topic of respect, while we may not have respect for someone who lies, or has taken advantage of us, or is hypocritical, or things like that, we are called to treat them with respect. Now, this is not a backdoor way of saying, oh, I can sin and I can get away with it because they were they wronged you. No, it's not that. But we are called to treat 
people with respect. You may not respect their views, may not respect what they do. You know, I gotta tell you, the other day I had a divine appointment. I was in town and I bumped into a guy who's been in and out of jail. I ministered to him multiple times. We had a nice chat on the street. He has some ideas, some ways of thinking, and he has done some actions that I do not respect. But I treat him with respect when I talk to him because he is a person created by God just like us. And so when we come to this issue of respect, there may be things that we struggle with with other people in respecting their views or whatever. But the point is this, we are to respect them, or you could say in parentheses, love them no less. We are to respect them as people created by God and loved by God. We are to see their value as somebody who's created in the image of God. And yes, sin comes along and distorts or tries to distort that image. We have to remember where we came from, too, before Christ, and God's still working on me. <clears throat> but you might be asking, well, Pastor, what, what do you mean this thing where we may not respect what they're saying or acting, but we're to treat them with respect? Where do you get that from? Well, I'll tell you where I get it from. The one who's our perfect example in all things, Jesus Christ. Because there was people that Jesus had to deal with that he didn't respect what they said, but he treated them with respect. I think of in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus stood in the temple in the synagogue and he was reading from Isaiah and he said that I have been called to preach the good news to the poor and set the captives free. And oh, the people love that. I mean, they did. They cheered him on. They were like, go Jesus. He said, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing today. They were all for him. But then he stopped and he said, and I'm summarizing here, basically he told them, you're not going to believe who I am. The day will come when you'll reject me. And all of a sudden it says that they got all upset. They drove him out of the synagogue and they tried to figure out ways they could kill him and get rid of him. That was just common folk. But later we're reminded in Luke chapter 19 around verse 41 that Jesus sat over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. Not for the buildings, not for the streets, not for the traffic lights or the school buses, but for the people who had rejected him. And he wept and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you'd only had known. How about his dealings with the Pharisees? There were times he called them whitewashed tombs. He called them hypocrites. In fact, we see in the scriptures, in, in again in Luke, uh, Luke 11, Jesus pronounced six woes upon the Pharisees. I mean, he, he laid it into them. He laced them, didn't he? He didn't mince words. He did not respect the way they abused people and all that. But he died on the cross for them. So while we may not respect the things people do, we're called, as the scripture says, treat everyone with respect. Treat everyone. The convenience store attendant. The person with neon green hair. The, the person who's on the opposite end of the political spectrum as you. The person who's on the opposite employment, the opposite end of the employment spectrum as you. The person who is on the opposite end of the world financially for you. We're called to respect. It's so easy to dis. Respect. Now remember, the word respect means to value. It's so easy to devalue people in our eyes. That's not what the Lord calls us to do. It's so easy to do that with words. With body language. Go ahead, Harvey. Tell me what you want to tell me. Facial expressions. Actions. Things that may not verbally say you don't matter, but that's the message that gets sent across. That's why Ephesians 4.29 says, let us say things, no unwholesome talk, but things that lift others up according to their need. So let's get real specific for just a couple minutes about this call to respect people. Because there are specifics in the Bible that we're told to respect various people. 
and here they are. Everyone, we've already talked about that, everyone, there's no parenthetical exceptions or a treat, everyone with proper respect. The elderly, Leviticus 19.32, stand in the presence of the aged. This is, this is, you know, we look at Leviticus and we say, oh, that's that boring book. Rise in the presence of the aged, show respect to the elderly, and revere your God, I am the Lord. So you think there's a connection between respecting the elderly and respecting God? You bet there is. Authorities, Romans chapter 13. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but in Romans 13, 1 through 7, it says everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. That's not a call to compromise our faith. And I will say this, that even people, even the governing authorities that we might disagree with, we're called to respect. And people have to make their own decisions. But you know, some years ago, this thing started where, you know how people, this, okay, this is George's little pet peeve, so don't look this up in the concordance or a Bible verse for this, but it ties in with it. But you know how sometimes people get invited to the White House? You know, a team wins a championship and they get invited to the White House or some other place with dignitaries there. I mean, that's a cool thing, you know. So some years ago, people started saying, I'm not going to go because I don't like that president or I don't like that governor or whatever. You know what? And we're called to be the light where there's darkness. We're called, and the light shines brightest in the darkness. And even if we had a government official that was the most ungodliest and whatever, not that I'm perfect, but you know what? If I won a championship or something like that, and I had an opportunity, I'd go. You know, that wouldn't be the time and place to headlock the president and say, listen, I want to talk to you, but maybe to develop, you know, a little bit of a rapport, and then, yeah, I'd just be the little common Joe, and, you know, out of 330 million people. Yeah. Why not go? But we're called to submit and respect authority. We're not called to trash people. And even when we disagree with them, we might vehemently disagree with people for whatever reason, whether it's politicians or not, but we are called to respect those in authority. And in verse 7 of Romans 13, it says this, if you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. Well, I could preach on all of these for an hour, but I'm not, because I know you'd be hungry by supper time. So. <laughs> um, families, 1 Timothy First Timothy. There's to be respect in families. Listen to what this says. I might skip some verses here, but in those eight or so verses, seven, eight verses, it starts off by saying, and, and this is talking about guidelines and church leadership, but the principle applies to families as well, that the husband must be respectable. That's in verse two of that passage. And then in verse four, it says that his children should obey him with respect. So there's to be respect amongst children. This is on the side of being respectable. Okay, Christ-like, respectable. And then in verse 11, it says the women are to be worthy of respect as well. So there's to be respect within the family unit. Boy, don't we, don't we see that lacking so much in our culture nowadays? Sure we do. And then in the marriages as well, we see in Ephesians, uh, here's what it says in Ephesians 5, 33, okay? The wife must respect her husband. So for you ladies that are married, memorize that verse, write it down 25 times. <laughs> but us men, we've got a verse to memorize and write it down 125 times. It's in 1 Peter 3, 7, where it says this. It says, men... Treat your wives with respect. Marriages. If we had more respect in marriages in America. And again, that's just not how people talk to each other. Respect is to be in marriages. And then amongst men. Okay, men, here we are. Titus chapter 2, verse 2. Teach, it says older men. Well, I guess that's all of us here, right? But it means anybody that's above being a kid. Teach them to be worthy of respect. How do we act? How do we treat others? How do we interact with people? And then women, you're not off the hook either because in Ephesians 5.33, again, 
it, that verse uh, talks about women being respectful of others. And then children, in Ephesians 6, 2, it says this, children, honor, that's that same word in the original language, honor your father and mother. So again, we see it as a family unit, and then we see it individualized men, women, and children. But then the Bible goes on to talk about in our relationship as employees and employers. And back in that day, they called it slaves. And if you still work today, maybe you feel like that sometimes at work. I don't know. But it says in Ephesians 6, 5, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect. Doesn't mean that if we disagree with somebody or we have a different idea or a different perspective that we can't share that, but we're to do it respectfully. And then in the community as a whole, as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, this is a great verse. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Wow. What a different world it'd be if we all just lived by that. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. So not only are we to treat others, everyone, with respect, but we are to act in such a way, not that we want to promote ourselves or pat our, pat our back, but we have to watch how we live so that we're worthy. In other words, because if we're not living in a way that's worthy of respect, we're really disrespecting God and others. And then the co-laborers in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. Here's what it says. Now we ask you to respect those who work hard among you. Now there's more to these verses. You can jot those down and read them on your own or whatever. But the point being is, is that really, you know, these are some specifics on how we are to relate with other people and respect other people that I wanted to mention to you. But again, it comes under the umbrella, treat everyone. But when we stop and we read these verses, we see that, wow, how, how we interact with others that we call brothers and sisters, that's huge. That's hugely important. We're called to, to remember the value of. Well, I could go on and on about it, but I'm not going to, that's enough for today. But here's a summary. Holy people are called to be holy in their interpersonal relationships because it's a matter of the great commandment. Love God and love people. I want to play a song for you right now. It's a pretty new song by a group called Unspoken, and uh, I'll have the words on the I'll have the words on the screen. I know that you also have the crystal handed out the paper to you. I did that so that you could take the words home and think about them, but. I just want to take a couple minutes and ask you to listen to this song. It's a great song. The word respect is not in it, but the word love is, and there's enough. So I pray this song encourages you. It's easy to say what I think, but it's hard to listen. It's easy to stand on the side and avoid all the trenches. But how are we gonna love our enemies when we can't even love our friends? We build walls, but we're called to build bridges instead. Thank you. 
old song. Pretty good message, that's right. Here's the bottom line. I saw this quote recently, and I think this is a great quote. Respect is love in plain clothes. Respect is love in plain clothes. That's why the title of today's message is Be a Plain Clothes Christian. I praise God for you. We've got a great church family here. We want to invite people in, and we want our church to grow and everything. We've got to be on our guard to not be like the world. There's enough disrespect out there. We're called to be uncontaminated by the world and to be people who respect others. And I think we do a really good job of that. I really do. And I thank you for that. I'm proud of you as my church family. But when we go out there and the pressure's on and it's so easy to get a little bit of contamination coming at us, we've got to be on our guard. So as we wrap up this morning, I pray that we would remember that respect is love and plain clothes and that we would have the mind of Christ our Savior. Michelle, would you come and lead us in that closing hymn? It's a great hymn of the faith. I invite you to stand as we sing this song. And it does go quicker than the traditional hymn, but the words are the same, so just to add Thank you so much for coming. Greet one another on the way out. Share a hug.